An Aboriginal protest movement in Canada has captivated the country and gained supporters around the world. But can Idle No More and the rest of Canada's Indigenous community come together and force the government to act? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shia Brutansi. The Idle No More movement in Canada, a nationwide call to action by Aboriginals, has gained significant momentum in recent weeks. It all began as opposition to a far-reaching set of laws introduced by Prime Minister Stephen Harper. The movement says that among other provisions, Omnibus Bill C-45 threatens Aboriginal treaty agreements and sovereignty. Almost two months ago, Chief Theresa Spence began a hunger strike in protest against the bill. More protests spread across the country and even internationally. There's been a call out for increased uh, demonstrations right across the country, including uh, even some economic disruptions. The movement has brought together various Aboriginal groups in Canada, fed up with their living conditions and treatment. Many of the more than one million Indigenous live in poverty. They lack clean water, housing and proper sanitation. But it's also mobilized environmental activists and those who feel the Canadian government has been acting undemocratically. Essentially what, what Mr. Harper has done is done us a favor because he's bringing all the people together, not just Aboriginal or Indigenous people, but Canadians as well because of, of the kinds of corrupt laws um, that he is passing because he is a majority government. And it's an abuse of power. Um, it's, a, it's a racist attitude. But while the movement is united in its cause, not everyone agrees on the best approach to make the Harper government back down. Joining us from Toronto, a spokesperson for the Idle No More movement, Pamela Palmata. And from Winnipeg, we have the Grand Chief Derek Napanak from the province of Manitoba. And in a moment, we'll be joined by Tim Powers. He's a former government advisor on Aboriginal affairs and a conservative strategist. Um, Pamela, first of all, then, let's begin with Friday's meeting in which some members mm -hmm. of the um, Assembly of First Nations leadership did meet with the Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, and those who attended said they were pleasantly surprised. Do you share that optimism that was being expressed? Uh, no, not at all. There was nothing new that came out of that meeting that wasn't already on the table 20, 30, 40 years ago. And, you know, just as a point of clarification, that meeting that happened was a meeting between the Assembly of First Nations and Prime Minister Harper. It wasn't a nation-to-nation -nation meeting with all of the First Nation leadership. The vast majority of chiefs that were in Ottawa were standing with the people outside at the protests. So, um, that's what's so interesting, uh, Chief Nepenak. Um, Grand Chief Nepenak, I mean, you refused to attend. Why did you refuse to attend? Well, first of all, I'll just say for clarification, I'm not from the province of Manitoba. I'm from the uh, ancestral lands of the Anishinaabeg people here in the Treaty 4 territory. I refused to uh, participate in the meeting because uh, the mandate from the chiefs of Manitoba was to ensure that we stood behind Chief Teresa Spence and Raymond Robinson from Manitoba who put their life on the line to change the discourse and to change the rules of, the, uh, of engagement with a conservative government who's keen on uh, applying uh, Indian Act policies and, and, uh, and managing the Indian relationship instead of really dealing with us on a truly nation-to-nation treaty territory by treaty territory relationship and foundation. Can you see why though some members of the Assembly of First Nations did attend, Grand Chief? Absolutely I can see why. You know, uh, a lot of our communities are in such disarray and living in a constant state of crisis that oftentimes uh, some of our leadership see that it's best to get what we can while we can get it. And it's from that, that angle of opportunism and that angle of, uh, of, of deficit perspective that I think sometimes chiefs go to the table and, and take whatever crumbs the, uh, the, government's, uh, the, the government of the day is willing to offer. Uh, Pamela, the sort of um, uh, outcome, the sort of, the sort of issues that seem to have been resolved in that meeting did seem rather vague there, continued high-level dialogue, enhanced yeah. oversight. Um, do we really know what yeah. was discussed? How much transparency was there in the first place? But, I mean, but what, do we, what should we make about these sort of broad headlines as to what came out of that meeting? 
Well, I think you're really raising a good point about the transparency of all of this because that whole week leading up to that meeting, the chiefs that were in Ottawa worked really, really hard to decide how they were going to go forward, if they were going to go forward and on what terms. And it put, they put a lot of effort into making sure that there was some kind of consensus. And a majority of the chiefs did come up with how they wanted to move forward. There was no accountability on the part of the AFN who took it upon themselves to go and make alternate arrangements and, and show up at that meeting and then we weren't even getting briefings of the meeting any faster than we would have gotten from the media and what did come out of it you know we've got a promise for more Harper oversight over Indian Affairs well we all know Minister Duncan isn't the one overseeing Indian Affairs it's already Harper and what we're trying to do is get Indian Affairs out of the business of managing First Nations communities and not more intervention and and the other thing about a, a high-level meeting well we had a Crown First Nation meeting. You, you don't get much more high level than that. And what did we get out of it? We got significant funding cuts to First Nation political organizations and communities and a whole suite of legislation that's going to increase paternalistic control over our communities instead of decrease it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not hopeful that anything more has come out of this meeting than did the Crown First Nation gathering. Grand Chief, you mentioned Theresa Spence. Her position has been she will meet with uh, Prime Minister Harper if the Governor General is also at that, that meeting. Is that your position then as well? I think that the Chiefs of Manitoba have, have recognized the, uh, the great commitment of Tree Suspense as well as Raymond Robinson from one of our communities here in Manitoba. They're willing to put their lives on the line for a very simple meeting with the Governor General, with the Prime Minister and First Nations leadership and that's where we entrenched our position and that's where we'll stand united moving forward. I wonder if you could perhaps explain then to international viewers why the Governor General's uh, presence is so important given he is, is a largely symbolic role. Well, you're going to hear different arguments, and if you, if you look at the Governor General's role as purely practical, certainly arguments can be made that he has no real power in the Constitution of Canada. But there is one very significant uh, uh, element to the role of the Governor General, and that is that he's the representative of the Crown. And we're really basing our discussion on the fundamental relationship with the Crown, and that, uh, that relationship runs like a common thread from generation to generation, tying the people that are alive today, the treaty people who are alive today, back to those very first and original agreements that go back hundreds of years with the Crown that are based on mutual respect, mutual recognition, and nation-to-nation -nation friendship and, uh, and, and opportunity. And that's what we're really about when we talk about the Governor General. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a principled approach, regardless of the practical limitations that, that Canadians may see on the, uh, the Governor-General today. Right. And then, and then uh, Grand Chief, I mean, you came out with a very strident statement, though, that these are demands and not requests. And indeed, uh, and has often been pointed out, um, the Aboriginal communities have the potential to bring the economy to its knees by blocking resource development, presumably, and so forth. All the, the economic policies that are so key to Stephen Harper. Were you, was that a threat, then? I mean, were you being, making some sort of specific, specific call to action? I think what we've witnessed is we've witnessed a rise in the grassroots people once again towards empowerment. And we do believe that uh, as, as political leaders that we, we do work and we are accountable back to the grassroots people. And I think that uh, the grassroots uh, movement that we see in Idle No More is a, is a, a movement that's, that's seated in, in the true power of peace and truth, first of all, and, uh, and kindness and respect and all those fundamental things that, that characterize Indigenous people in this part of the world. We are a, we are a peace-loving people, that first and foremost. Now, if uh, certain activities are undertaken by, by certain groups to, to, block, uh, to block railroads or to interfere in pipelines and so forth, that is an expression that uh, we do not endorse. However, with that said, you know, we've been living under very tightly controlled economic sanctions for generations now as Indigenous people. Uh, we believe that that exercise of policy management that successive Canadian governments have imposed on us is a form of violence. It's a form of economic violence um, uh, denying Indigenous people true participation in what could be a very powerful Canadian uh, nation state. Right, and it's interesting that one of the founders of Idle No More, um, Sylvia McAdam, has been critical of, of some of the blockades that have taken place. She told uh, the CBC in an interview, I think those portray a message of aggressiveness uh, that's not uh, peaceful. Having said that, though, Pamela, we talk about the grassroots, we talk about the exploitation, we talk about the rising anger. Um, isn't this just another example, then, of the leadership of these movements, perhaps, 
becoming overly pragmatic, really, and then deciding, okay, we can do a deal, when actually maybe some of the muscle that is in this movement is precisely in civil disobedience. That's how you get leverage. Well, I think you really have to understand what we're talking about here. So, so first of all, you know, the founders which started the hashtag and the call to action, they're not the leader any more the leaders of the movement than I am. It's the grassroots people that are taking this on. And the, the one thing about this movement, aside from it being in partnership with Canadians, is that it respects the sovereignty of individuals and respects the sovereignty of individual nations. And, you know, when we're talking about peace and friendship, because this whole movement is based on our inherent rights, our relationship with Canadians and the peace and friendship foundation of our treaties, there is nothing inherently aggressive or violent about temporary traffic slowdowns or temporary border slowdowns. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of what's actually taking place. For the most part, it's handing out leaflets, educating Canadians, and we found right across the country, Canadians get out of their cars and join us on these temporary slowdowns. So it's, it's the terminology that we use to talk about the movement, whether it's a, a violent blockade and and we haven't seen that yet and our calls all across the country have been for peaceful temporary slowdowns or or peaceful marches or, or peaceful round dances no violence is involved or envisioned whatsoever I wonder whether this and, is and I, I would uh, no, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to add. I was just going to add about the governor general because I think that's a really important conversation. Most people misunderstand that his role is just symbolic, and there is a lot of symbolism here because he's representing uh, the sovereign uh, queen, and th that's who we sign treaties with. But don't forget, he also retains the royal prerogative power of that sovereign and he has the ability to remove the prime minister from office he has the ability to stop things happening in canada that are unconstitutional or that are putting canada in jeopardy and if you and take for example should the prime minister act above the law well Many of us feel that the Prime Minister is acting above the law with these omnibus bills and all of the other legislation that violates our treaties. Why? Because they're constitutionally protected. So the Governor General has the potential to come in and address some of these issues. And I think it's very important that he be in attendance. Um, I, I, it might be not a bad idea to uh, hear what uh, Ellen Gabriel uh, said. She was the chief negotiator for the last major uh, uprising, the, what was known as the Ochre Crisis of, of 1990. Here's how she summarized uh, what was going on now in Canada. I think it's, it's a movement of the people, it's the movement of the oppressed, and it's a movement of the grassroots because they're informing the leadership now who has for too long taken too much of a moderate view in advocacy for our rights. And I think that's, that brings power to, to the leadership if they want it. But if, if they're not going to use that kind of strength, then, then it weakens the unity. And I'm pleased to say now we can bring in Tim Powers. He's a former government advisor on Aboriginal affairs and a conservative strategist. We'll get into some of what Ellen Gabriel was addressing in a moment. But Tim Powers, um, I, th I think you were able to hear some of our discussion in, in the last few minutes. If this key sticking point to, to aid conflict resolution is simply to have a meeting involving the governor general, why not have that meeting? Well, there was a symbolic meeting with the Governor General, but in terms of the way our Constitution is structured, the Governor General is the symbolic head of the government. It is the Prime Minister and his cabinet who ultimately make the day-to-day -day decisions uh, that have the ability to change the lives of, uh, of many of the people who are asking for change. So if you want outcomes, uh, it's the Prime Minister you should be meeting with. But clearly if you want outcomes, you need the Governor General at that meeting, I mean, otherwise you're not going to have the, the all-encompassing <laughs> negotiation. Well, I, I, I challenge you on that. I mean, I think, uh, there, as has often stated, and Pam and others have talked about it, certainly there's a, an important relationship between many First Nations and the Crown, and the Crown is represented in Canada by the Governor General, but it's the policies of the Prime Minister. And I think there have been many First Nations leaders, and some of them spoke about this last week, who were uh, happy enough and understood the way our system worked. I think Matthew Kuncom, the former Grand Chief, 
uh, spoke of this as well, that uh, working with the Prime Minister is the way to get this done. I think the danger is to get distracted in who meets with whom uh, rather than actually meeting to get some things done and focusing on some targets. And I think that's part of the frustration, not just within the Aboriginal community, uh, but also uh, with the government. Where should the focus be? Because Idle No More <coughs> arguably has a, a bunch of different things it would like looked at. Theresa Spence has some, the AFN has another, and I think that just causes more chaos. Right, but if, but if there's a chief who's on a hunger strike, uh, risking her life, uh, and indeed mm -hmm. there's been decades of broken promises, isn't this at least a sign of goodwill that negotiations will take place uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a proper manner? Well, proper. I mean, there have been negotiations. There was a First Nations Crown meeting last year. There was a, uh, the meeting this past week, two meetings, if you want to count the meeting with the Governor General. I think the, the focus of the government and, and many uh, First Nations people is on finding out what can be done to get things done to better their lives in communities, not the, um, the circus in part, and all parties were active in it, that was part of the meeting exercise last week. Grand Chief, I mean, that is the argument then. Label, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, ahead. I'm going to provide an interjection here. Yeah. If you want to call anything a circus, let's talk about the Crown mm. First Nations gathering last year yeah. where the Prime Minister came into the room. He did not, uh, he, he, he did not address the chiefs in, a, in an engagement. He, he spoke in the general direction of the chiefs in colourful metaphors and uh, didn't provide for any direct interaction. And then there was a series of photo opportunities that happened. If you want to talk about a circus, Let's start looking at the Crown First Nations mm. gathering last year. But it's and you know, a lot of chiefs came to this year's meeting looking at the Crown First Nations gathering last year and saying, you know what, you fooled me once last year, you're not going to fool me again this year. Yeah. And that's the position that, uh, that, that, we, that we had in the back of our minds going into that meeting. We're not going to let the Prime Minister uh, create chief. another circus out of, uh, out of engagement. Tim Powers. Yeah. But Grand Chief, wasn't yeah. it wasn't it your only? Uh, it was it was your the, the chief, the average Assembly of First Nations that represents you, Mr. Atlio, Chief Atlio, who had wanted these meetings as well. I think there's a split in the community. I think you would grant me that over uh, over the effectiveness or non-effectiveness of these things. But it was the First Nations leaders themselves that were pushing for another meeting. So it does beg the question: If the last one, according to you, was a circus, why did the leaders want a, a meeting of a similar right, so tone and tenor? I think I think this is very interesting because, Pamela, this does raise the issue there. Yep. This, 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 this movement is often called Idle No More, but it is much more disparate than that. It's a patchwork of different yeah. uh, organizations, of communities. There's Idle No More. Um, there's the a AFN, who we've mentioned, the Assembly of First Nations. There are those within the Assembly of First Nations who don't necessarily agree with their leadership. There's Theresa Spence. There are other uh, indigenous groups. There are progressive forces. Do you not see, then, perhaps, um, that this is where the government is going to try and strike, though. It, it is, I mean, classic colonialism 101, though. Isn't it just going to be divide and oh, rule? How are you going yeah. to keep all this together? Yeah. Well, and there's, I haven't seen much of a problem about keeping this together because we knew that Harper would refuse to listen to us. We knew that Harper would try to be his typical bully self and try to control every aspect of that meeting so that there would be no outcome. And we also knew that they would try smear campaigns against Chief Spence, that they would come out, send their pundits out and try to be critical of the movement. But the one thing the movement has done is everything has worked in tandem. So all of the chiefs in assembly in Ottawa that protested on Parliament against the legislation, against the funding cuts, and, and trying to to bring about uh, that treaty relationship where we can share the lands and resources. That's the exact same message of Idle No More, and that was the exact same message of Chief Theresa Spence. And we have been consistent and coordinated and working in tandem. The only, the only divisive part here was Harper's control over uh, certain elements of the AFN and, and trying to get everything off the rails. But that hasn't changed anything. But might, so not, might that not be of key, what, though? What happened with the AFN? Gr Grand Chief, Sorry? That, might that not be key? Because clearly this is the argument that's being made. There, there's that technocratic element of the AFN leadership who does believe a deal can be made to help those suffering in, um, in Aboriginal communities now. And then there are those with a more... Uh, who has decided enough is enough, that this is time to, to redress these, balance, uh, these imbalances once and for all and indeed make the government admit its colonial, uh, its colonial past and colonial present. Uh, but that's not going to help people in, in, in the short term and isn't that where they're going to they're going to jimmy some kind of, some kind of d distance between, uh, between the opposition to the government?
Well, certainly, I think we'll, we'll certainly see an attempt to try to, uh, pr pr you know, uh, move in a, in a pr practical kind of kind of way and and take what we can while we can uh, in, in this particular moment. But you know, there are a number of chiefs right across the country, and even though you know certain regions had representation in the prime minister's meeting, it does not mean that there's there's not a fraction within the provinces or the territories mm -hmm. that were in there, because there certainly is. There's a very large number of chiefs who are who are who are tired. Uh, standing with grassroots people who are tired of the constant policy application of the Harper government, um, tired of prescriptive timelines, prescriptive agendas, predetermined agendas going into these Ottawa meetings. You know what, we're going to stand with our people. And you know, within the circles of influence that we do have, if we, stand, if we stand strong on our principles, there will be consistency across the board, regardless of what organization is sending what message. There is consistency at the fundamental level, and for that it was a great victory last week. Tim Powers, is, is the fundamental problem though is isn't um, Prime Minister Harper's entire economic strategy based on everything that um, those currently opposing his government in the streets, um, uh, you know, are, are, are against? I mean, is that fundamental neoliberal economic policy and and, and, and sort of um, drill baby drill attitude, which he has no intention really of changing? Isn't that poss possibly why there's a lack of a lack of trust about the seriousness of the government? Well, I don't know if you have a map up and are able to show your viewers, but if you did, you could start at Canada's east uh, and go across the north, and you would see in a number of different jurisdictions, starting in my home territory of Newfoundland and Labrador, our most easterly province, that the government business and Aboriginal leaders working together, signing agreements to develop those very resources that are contested in different parts. There, I, I agree with the, the Grand Chief, there are fractures. There are fractures across the country, but there are also some uh, significant achievements that are occurring. Nunavut, one of our new Northern Territories, for example, on the resource question that you're asking, just announced the development of a $4 billion mine where the Inuit people received money, rightly so, from the Government of Canada to begin a negotiation process negotiated a process to benefit. I think there is uh, then more court. compromise was, was that, to Is that the 1993 agreement and they never got their money? Yeah, Pardon? exactly. Uh, aren't That's they currently exactly in litigation? Right. That's a really good example. They, they no, never no, got no, the money. No, 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 no. The Baffin, the Baffin land, yeah. no, I'm talking about a $3 million fund, which I'm happy to provide to you, that they uh, was given to them to help come together to move forward the Baffin land project. I thought that they were suing. create $4 billion worth of opportunity. Uh, no, sir, they're not. Um, well, Pamela, what do we make I'm of that? Then? So that, there is too. there is this harmony then. Yeah, well, I mean, y you need to talk to Nunavut because Nunavut has been saying for years and making uh, presentations about how while they had this wonderful historic agreement, Canada has consistently failed to live up to its obligations. And it's not just Nunavut either. There are other self-governing communities who signed agreements many, many years ago and the federal government has failed to live up even to the spirit of modern day agreements. They're constantly saying that they can't live up to the spirit and intent of historical treaties. Well, they certainly have the same problem with modern agreements that their own lawyers negotiated. So there's not a lot of good faith all the way around in this relationship. Uh, Grand Chief, then, what is the strategy I, I going, for, going forward? Uh, and, and Tim, I will give you the last word. But Grand Chief, what is, you know, you again sure. talk about um, bringing the economy to its knees. At what point does that actually mean something tangible? Well, you know, our strategy here in Manitoba has always been to uh, to try and work in peace and harmony where we can, and, and that that means that we're putting together practical steps within Canada's constitution to look at the natural resource transfer agreements, to look at ways of restructuring the relationship so that we can reattach ourselves as the Indigenous people back to the land. And we believe that uh, the practical way of doing that is by building uh, processes towards uh, creating opportunity to realize tangible benefits from, from, um, from resource development. Now, that means that it only happens when the ground is ready, when the lands are ready, when the environment is shown that it won't be compromised. And Tim Powers, I mean, you think there's a way to reconcile those uh, ideals with those of the energy companies who, according to a letter leaked to Greenpeace last week, uh, have a great deal of control over the Canadian uh, government's agenda right now? Well, it, well, it's already happening, Shihab. I, I would cite the example, I think it would be familiar to Pam and the Grand Chief of the Labrador Innu, uh, who have signed what's called a new Dawn Agreement to be able to be active partners and owners in the largest hydroelectric development in North America, the Lower Churchill Project. I agree with the Grand Chief. There should be more of these, but they're out there. Attawapiskat, where Chief Spence is from, has an agreement, an impacts and benefits agreement with De Beers. I think that has to happen. I think it is happening. 
Uh, and I think everybody should be able to benefit from it. And in, prior to our further discussion, or in relation to our further discussion, what I was talking about was the Nunavut Resources Corporation, the money that was invested there on the 17th of April of last year. All right, thank you, Tim. Uh, Tim Powers, Pamela uh, Paul Mata, uh, Grand Chief Derek Napanak. I realize we didn't talk about climate change and actually the impact of this drilling on the earth. Uh, we will do that in another show uh, to come. But that's it from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find more information about the program. And we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AljazeeRa.net.